Hi, I'm Kat and today I have for you a true crime case and today uh, we are talking about Cherish Periwinkle and this is part 2 of the series so if you haven't watched the first part I highly suggest you watch that first before watching this one otherwise it might not make much sense to you as I'm not going to be giving any overview in today's video so again please do watch part 1 before watching this part for everybody else thank you so much for joining me again and let's get into it during those three weeks of freedom before killing cherish donald smith walked into shan's hospital and told an employee he had been on a crack offender for four days and asked to be committed under what is called a baker act because he wanted to kill his drug dealer the Baker Act is a Florida law that enables families and loved ones to provide emergency health services and temporary detention for people who are impaired because of their mental illness and who are unable to determine their needs for treatment. In a report, the worker said that Donald was really seeking a residential treatment program, but he was turned away. Days later, Cherish was dead. Donald Smith said he used crack in the bathroom of the Walmart before luring Cherish out of the store. He told the doctor that crack turns him into a monster. Later, he blamed Cherish for her death, saying he had to kill her because she got in his van. Heather Holmes, a forensic psychologist, diagnosed Donald Smith with an antisocial disorder, borderline personality disorder, clinical depression, severe disorder and disorder. In the 70s, he had been given a similar diagnosis. In prison, Donald Smith was constantly in trouble. Documents show he lied to prison officials and was found in possession of narcotics and other contraband. His answers to prison officials changed by the day. At one point, he told the psychologist he had no comment about whether or not he had violence fantasies. Asked four months later, Donald said, not anymore, I don't. Explaining why he didn't want to participate in treatment while incarcerated, he said, this program will never touch the type of modalities I've been through. In 2006, a team of psychologists determined he did not meet the criteria to be locked up in the state's treatment facility for violence in part because he refused to be interviewed. When he was released, a court agreement shows that he was scheduled to receive depolupron shots to chemically castrate him. The documents do not show if he actually followed through with the treatment and DCF said that's medically privileged information. While the new information might shed some light on Donald Smith, Cherish's mother's boyfriend says that this won't bring back their little girl. Donald Smith bragged about the murder charges he faced in the death of eight-year-old Cherish, comparing himself to notorious offenders like Casey Anthony. He said the case is probably one of the most explosive cases that's ever come out of Jacksonville. TV camera from all over in the back of the court. I think it was, I think it may have been, I think it may have been uh, Jennifer Waugh that was back there. Either Jennifer Waugh or my Sharon Will camera, but there was, there was a television camera back there too. Right, and then all of a sudden, bam, out of nowhere. You know, it's, this chick with her head is shaved on the side, she's got these piercings and tattoos of, you know, teardrops coming down her face and stuff like that. And, uh, she knew everything. I mean, because uh, after they separated us, so I went back in the back and locked me in a cell, locked her in a cell. I mean, she knows that the case is detail for detail for detail. I mean, everything. She knows it down to the wire. It's probably because she was abused as a child, I don't know. And she, you know, or she's got kids or whatever. There's, there's people out there that you would think wouldn't have, that don't have a damn clue about anything that's going on right around them, right beside them. You know, faces all broken out with sores. You know, his beard is all down here. He saw me standing at that window and he got me all there right there and then he got me out and up. And he says, hey, that's the guy right there. 
Yeah. There's no TVs here. You can tell he sleeps on the streets or he's living at the shelter or whatever. Because he's been arrested. Yeah, he's been arrested. There's people up there with mental problems. I mean, he's in a red jumpsuit. He's a mental case. He didn't do me right away. Just like that. Just like that. Immediate recognition. Immediate. The girl that was in with a, with a tag, she was in a red jumpsuit. Knew me immediately. Knew everything about the case. Extremely well informed. Knew everything. Heard her talking about it. And was there for the, the Anthony case. Okay. Uh, the taxi cab killer that was here, Paul DeRusso. You know, this is bigger. This is bigger than that. This is bigger than all of that. This has got every major component in the in, the, in this system that makes this the most, one of the most ex this is probably the most, one of the most explosive cases that's ever come out of Jacksonville. Yes, really. Because, I mean, they have upgraded. They have upgraded. You know, I'm not going to try to scare you. They have upgraded my case to premeditated capital felony murder. <clears throat> I'd have been better off trying to kill the president. I wouldn't have got this kind of press. The worst charge that you can ever get. It's the worst charge you can have in the history of anything. It's the worst. And 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 coupled with that makes it emotional. I'm telling you, it's a power gay. It's a power gay. I mean, I could easily, I could easily, I could easily say it turned into a riot downtown. I'm telling you. It's that big. I mean, I don't think you, I don't know if you realize it. Yeah. This is way bigger than anything. It's way bigger than Anthony. Way bigger. This would be way more, way more highly charged than that guy that was just down there shooting the... Huh? And all the details of this. Capital. First premeditated. Capital murder. Capital, it's the charge. Capital battery on a minor under the age of 12 and kidnapping from a Walmart. Those ingredients right there are a nuclear bomb. Kidnapping, you have death, and you have of a child. That is explosive material to the max. Haley Anthony didn't have all that. She was just missing. And look at that. I mean, they have bodyguards all around her. I don't even know whether the child is dead or not. Just missing. This is huge. Be aware. It is, it is huge. It's as big as anything that's ever hit. It's as big as any Jimmy Rice or anything like that. It's, it's that. It's that big. Donald told his mom about the night he kidnapped and killed Cherish from a north side Walmart. He said he knew he was effed as soon as she got into his van. Noting that he was already a registered he recalled thinking, Don, you got an eight-year-old girl in your van. They'll never believe anything you say. The girl had to go, he said.
crazy. Walk out the door. She walks 
Smith even asked his mom to buy him a copy of the DSM-4, A Guide to Mental Disorders, so he knows exactly how to act mentally ill. Quote, we have to be careful about how we express ourselves, he told his mom, and continued to whisper or use sign language. His mother worked as a sign language interpreter. He acknowledged that even if he pulled off a psychiatric defense, he won't be coming home soon. Not right away or for a very long time, probably not years, but at least I'll be in a hospital. A civilized treatment setting where people treat you like a human being.
this whole thing really is evolving around ecological and um, I mean that part of it is everything it's huge and um, um, anyway uh, I mean, I feel like, you know, I should be kind of preparing my, preparing myself in some kind of way, familiarizing myself, can you hear me? Familiarizing myself with, uh, Thank you. 
Arnold expressed his worries about being sent to prison. He said he preferred to be sent to a mental hospital, but prefers death over being housed with other inmates. I don't want prison, he said. I'd rather go to death row because I'm going to die anyway. Prison is going to kill me. At least on death row, they just give me a shot and I'll just go to sleep. But every moment, every day, I'll never know in prison when it's coming. It's going to be violent, violent. And I may not even die. I could be crippled, have my eye poked out or end of quote. This lady, Rain, she doesn't have that opportunity. Her daughter is gone. Her daughter is gone. No last words, no last I love yous of whatever. She's just gone. I'm not sure you know, what's going to happen here. <laughs> I was arrested on the 21st, I believe. And I was booked into the county jail on the 22nd. So her, uh, her, the incident would have happened on the night of the 21st. I was booked into the county jail on the 22nd, which would have been Thursday, and then the Friday would have been, I would have been gone to first appearance. Just kind of lining up. Just, once it's over, it's over. Well, when this thing is over, it's just going to be over. You know, uh, it's just going to be over, and that's it. So, uh, you know, we'll do what we can do. I can't say things to these people, <laughs> you know, like Woodard and stuff like that. Stuff I can't say to them, there's just no way. You know, nothing, there's no way. Uh, the private doctor, no. Yeah. You know, but, uh, you know, uh, there's no way because I'm not in the program. I don't have confidentiality. And the court can subpoena those records too, and he has to give it to them. You know, so there's just, I just never, or AA, <laughs> hey, how high in the world, you know what I mean? There's no way. You may have to call an attorney. I don't know yet. Try to find out as much as we can before that court date, because this court date can be the whole, the whole ball of wax if we don't pre pre prepare ourselves. in a million different ways, but and every year I would think, well, what am I going to do about it this year? Am I going to just go to my grave sick and hiding and uh, alone? Or am I going to do something about it? <sighs> Too much to face. I'll never be able to work through it. You know, that's what I'm telling myself. Never be able to work through all this. Never. I'll never be okay. So rather than spend the rest of my life being humiliated by myself, telling all this crap in my head, I might as well just die with it easier to just die with it because I'll probably never get through it anyway. That's what my brain's telling me. Never be able to work it all out anyway. Don't have the capacity that much honesty. I don't know if I can handle, I, I don't know if I can face that much. Don't know. If I, if my, if I could, I mean I'm already
so separated from society already, you know, because of my thinking that if I were to start admitting, you know, and start disclosing, uh, I don't know anything about a healing process. I thought it was just, you know, okay, now everybody knows, but nothing's going to change. So now I'm worse off than when I started. That's the way I feel, you know what I mean? But I, that's the reason I really kind of want this because at every turn, at every turn, for some reason, I mean, they can't spot it. They can't spot it. I don't know. They can't spot it. Maybe I'm too lucid. And I'm not like, you know, like you see guys are like, you know, you see them like that. I'm not like that. But still, I was out three weeks. Because it is so crazy, you don't know what to think. If I had a gun, I'd blow my freaking brains out. Next morning, that morning, all the police came up on me. I thought about it.
Could it have happened the way they said? Yes, it could have. It could have. Because...
labels so it wasn't really you know she, she didn't know but with what I have as baggage <coughs> and then and that's what happened and that's how it came off. And it kind of, it kind of built up the uh, woman was manic. Manic. And uh, the kids were going crazy. She had no control. No control. 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 I just emotionally went right over the falls. 
no turning back, helpless, just as helpless as I can be. No control whatsoever, none. No conscious reasoning power, no nothing. Gone. News outlets in Florida and the U.S. covered Cherish's murder extensively. In Jacksonville, live broadcasts highlighted Donald Smith's crime convictions in 1977, 1992, and 2009. Outlets in Panama City, Tallahassee, Orlando, Tampa, and Miami reported on the murder. Even CNN and Fox News picked up the story. City news stations dedicated web pages to the case and many blogs and social media posts discussed the murder. Media outlets also covered the effect of the murder on the local community and the community's outreach to rain. Hundreds, rain, if you don't remember from our from part one, is Cherish's mother. Hundreds of people attended Cherish's funeral, which was locally televised. 18 to 1900 people signed the guest book at Cherish's viewing. Families that had never met the Periwinkles stopped by their home with groceries. To a West Side Church tonight to say goodbye to Cherish Periwinkle. Many didn't know her, but say the eight-year-old's kidnapping and murder rocked them to their core. Tonight's viewing celebrated the young girl who had so much life ahead of her. Channel 4 Scott Johnson was at the church tonight and spoke with those touched by her death. Very somber night tonight here at the church where they will have funeral services tomorrow. Tonight it was a viewing for Little Cherish. These are some of the buttons they handed out as she showed up in that hearse right there in a small child-sized casket. Very sad night for everyone who showed up. Around 18 to 1900 is what is estimated to have signed this guest book to say goodbye to the little girl lying in this small casket. There's a difference in seeing an older person, but actually see a child that, you know, that you're still raising is it is heartbreaking. When I found out I felt like she was my child. You see what I'm saying? And it just hurts me that somebody took a life that way. While almost 2,000 showed up, only around 30 actually knew Cherish before the horrific news this weekend that she had been murdered. Pat Bowman and Sylvia McClendon drove from halfway to the beach to the west side to say goodbye. And just compassion for the little child and the outrage of this happening. I just felt so sorry that that poor little girl didn't have a lot of things she should have had and that she ended up passing the way she did. The tears were continual with every person who looked in the casket and paid their respects to cherish his mom, Rain, who has been the target of a lot of public criticism. But the pastor here at the church, Steve Dobbs, says all the criticism in the world can't hurt her like the loss of her daughter has. That can't phase her you know, because she says that she has to live with the decisions that she makes. And uh, you know, regardless of what is said, what you know, we have to love, and that's what the church is about. That's what God is about. It's about love. And once again, they said roughly 30 people knew her. The other close to 2,000 did not know Cherish, but a lot of family and friends here tonight with Cherish's mom for support. Donald Smith's case progressed to trial, and in 2015, his defense team filed a motion to change venue. They argued that widespread media coverage had painted him as a monster who should be executed, a predator who was guilty beyond doubt. The court ultimately impaneled the jury without an objection from defense counsel or a request for a final ruling on its motion to change venue. Before the trial began, Donald Smith also filed a motion to prevent the state from offering autopsy photos of the victim. Counsel argued that because Dr. Valerie Rao, the chief medical examiner for Duval County and the trained pathologist was to testify to Cherish's injuries, there was no need to introduce photos of those injuries. Donald Smith's team argued that the picture's unduly prejudicial emotion effect would outweigh their, pro their probative value. The trial court denied his motion. The state 
called Dr. Rao to testify to the extent of Cherish's injuries. Dr. Rao had performed Cherish's autopsy and had been present at the creek when her body was recovered. As Dr. Rao testified, the state introduced 26 pictures of Cherish's autopsy into evidence. Dr. Rao described injuries on Cherish's scalp, chest, legs, arm, neck, chin, lip, nose, eyes, genitals and throat. The autopsy showed that Cherish had been raped before her murder, suffered blunt force trauma to the back of her head and was strangled with what appeared to be a t-shirt, with such force that she began bleeding from her eyes, gums and nose. The evidence of a struggle showed Cherish was conscious when Donald strangled her. When the prosecutor asked Dr. Rao about Cherish's throat, Dr. Rao stammered slightly and asked for a break to compose herself. The judge dismissed the jury and defense counsel moved for a mistrial, arguing that Dr. Rao's response was so prejudicial that it could not be cured by any jury instruction. The court denied the motion. After the 10-minute recess, Dr. Rao resumed her testimony without further interruption. The state later called a crime lab analyst who testified that Donald Smith's DNA was found on and inside Cherish's body. He put the odds at 1 in 35 quintillion that the DNA belonged to someone else. The state also produced surveillance footage of Donald leading Cherish from Walmart to his van. Most of the photos shown in the trial identified separate injuries on Cherish's body. There were multiple photos of Cherish's and throat which were necessary to demonstrate the extent of the damage done to her body during the battery and to support the medical examiner's explanation of the time period and force required to strangle her to death. Donald Smith's DNA was found, like I said, in and on Cherish's body. He was caught on several different surveillance cameras leading Cherish to his car. Multiple witnesses spotted his van by the water in which Cherish's bo body was found and his pants were soaking wet as he was arrested. At the penalty phase of the trial, Donald Smith presented nine witnesses, including a psychologist, a neurologist and his son. The state presented what we, one witness, the victim of a 1992 attempted kidnapping by Donald Smith. GSO employees then testified to getting information from a confidential informant about conversations Donald Smith was having through an air vent with another inmate in an adjacent isolation cell talking about the case. The recording devices that investigators put in those vents captured some conversations, including the two talking about young teens. In the second day into the trial, these secret recordings of Donald came to light. In these recordings, Donald could be heard talking to inmates about a group of 12 and 13 year old girls that visited the jail. That's right up my alley, right there. That's my target area, he said. I'd like to run into her at at Walmart. He then added that Cherish had a butt on her, she had a lot for a white girl. That's just completely disgusting. The defense didn't call any witnesses and Donald Smith himself declined to testify in his own defense. They were very limited in their cross-examination and also waived their right to present a closing argument. The doctor who performed the autopsy described how Cherish's anatomy had been distorted by the force with which Donald and uh, I actually watched the medical examiner's testimony on the stand and without going into all the horrific details of what she said to give you an idea of how badly distorted Cherish's anatomy was from the rape. If you have given birth naturally then you might have had the misfortune of having ribs which need this teaching, right? Between the front beats and the back, you know what I mean if you are a woman and you gave birth, so the front and the back as well. That's how badly Cherish's injuries down there were. The skin between the front and the back was almost torn. They didn't even have to spread the legs of this little girl to see the injuries inside there. The medical examiner also said it would have taken Cherish around 5 minutes to die while being strangled and Cherish 
fought for her life. After the medical examiner's testimony, she requested to be excused from the courtroom for a moment and she left this rot. Before asking for the break, she looked completely shaken by what she had to describe. She had tears in her eyes and you could tell that when she spoke generally about injuries and anything to do with her profession, she was okay. But as soon as the medical examiner had to start describing Cherish's injuries, she was visibly affected by it. Cherish didn't die quickly and she didn't die easily. Hers was a brutal and total death. Further recordings revealed how Donald intended to use an insanity defense at his trial. In a phone conversation with his mother, he could be heard asking her for a copy of the DSM-4, a guide to mental disorder, so that he could practice acting mentally ill in court. He also added that he hoped to be sentenced to death rather than life in prison because he was afraid his fellow inmates would kill him. In what would be one of the most high-profile cases of the greater Jacksonville area, in recent memory, Donald Smith was charged with a first-degree murder, kidnapping of Cherish Periwinkle. Following the presentations in the trial, the jury unanimously recommended that Donald Smith be sentenced to death exactly what he wanted. The jury deliberated for 19 minutes before unanimously finding him guilty. By special verdict, the jury convicted him of both premeditated and felony murder with kidnapping and battery as the underlying felonies. One of the jurors who found Donald Smith guilty of kidnapping, capital battery and first degree murder in the death of 80 year old Cherish Periwinkle described to News 4 Jacks Monday, how the trial changed his life. 12 jurors sentenced Donald Smith to death for the brutal murder of Cherish Periwinkle in Jacksonville. Now, for the first time, we're hearing from one of those jurors. Our Ann Schindler sat down with Juror 18 to talk about the lingering impacts of this emotional case. His demeanor during the whole trial was kind of odd to me that he'd wink at the camera or kind of, he'd glare, you know, not glare back, but he just kind of would stare at us. Kind of made me kind of funny feeling inside that he would just do the act of the way he did. Paul Hinson is still processing a mix of emotions from the Donald Smith trial. And a lot of people said, I couldn't have done it. You know, that I, I couldn't have done it or I wouldn't have done it. He's haunted by the evidence photos. You know, the pictures themselves are graphic enough, but when you have a medical examiner telling you exactly the torture and the pain inflicted on her for who knows how long, nobody should have to go through that. You can see that they've been impacted. State Attorney Melissa Nelson warned jurors the trial would change them. They don't plan or ask to see these things, and I knew how it affected me, and I've seen these things, so I absolutely, we wanted to prepare them for what they were about to see. Uh, there should be some resources. Criminal defense attorney Curtis Fallgatter says jurors in this case saw some uniquely disturbing evidence. If they've been harmed emotionally, psychologically, by having to participate in a horrific trial, there ought to be some mechanism to get them some assistance. Right now, there are no resources like that. Hinson says he's trying to move ahead, but admits he experiences almost daily flashbacks. You know, a white van or you see somebody walking down the road that's, you know, with a kid, you know, you're going to look twice. Could that be the next Donald Smith? Donald Smith is responsible for the crime, Hinson says, but others share blame for the tragedy. I mean, the mother had responsibilities, Cherish had responsibilities, the state had responsibilities of, of, you know, letting it get this far. As for testimony about Donald Smith's brain abnormalities, Hinson is unpersuaded. You know, they said he did have brain damage and maybe does, maybe doesn't. I don't know, you know, I mean, to use it as an excuse is kind of reaching. When they first went into deliberations, however, about four jurors were leaning towards a life sentence. A couple people were on the fence line of saying, you know, life in prison. And that the aggravating factors outweigh the mitigating circumstances. After some discussion, he says, the verdict was unanimous. We, the jury, unanimously find that the defendant, Donald James Smith, should be sentenced to death. Well, there's sick people in the world, and, and that's, what, that's why they have the death penalty, because they don't need to be on this planet anymore. If this case didn't warrant the death penalty, then what does? 
Paul Hinson, juror number 18, talked about how difficult it was to hear testimony, including graphic details from medical examiner Valerie Rao, who described Cherish's brutal and tortured final moments of life. That, for him, was the hardest part of the trial. Listening to the medical examiner, going over each specific detail of her from the time they found the body to doing the autopsy and everything else, and her describing what each mark on her body was, whether it was before or after she died, and then having the pictures that he had to look at for two hours. For him, Dr. Rao's testimony was both sad and shocking. To see an innocent body lying on a steel table and seeing the stuff that she went through and seeing an innocent person laying there, you know, that stuff, whether you are a part of this trial or not, to sit there and have to identify a body or to see a body and to see it for two hours, to see each and every part of what she was describing and having to sit there and listen to it. End of quote. Paul, the juror, said that the trial changed his life, describing how certain words will forever trigger memories of Cherish, as well as Donald Smith. Quote, there are always going to be keywords that come to mind, you know, during the trial, and as soon as you see one or hear one, is going to bring back the trial itself, he said. A white van or Walmart, going to Walmart and seeing an older person with a younger kid, you are going to look twice. Is that really their grandfather? Is that really their father? Or is that going to be the next Donald Smith taking somebody out of the door? End of quote. Paul Hinson became emotional at the thought of Cherish. Taking advantage of an eight-year-old and to what he did and show no remorse whatsoever, the juror said, is just the way he planned it out. He had ample opportunities to leave and he didn't. He kept going and going on. He went on to talk about Donald's demeanor during the trial. Donald just sat there and showed no emotions and he thought it was all about him during the trial. Paul Hinson also said it was easy for him and the other jurors to find Donald Smith guilty based on the evidence. It only took them 12 minutes to reach a verdict, but jurors took more time to decide to recommend the death penalty in the case. Paul Hinson said that the defining moment for him came during prosecutor Mark Lyler's final, final argument, in which he recapped the horrific Cherish endured and her gruesome murder. When Kalil, in his closing arguments, he said, forget about the rest of the trial, this is about the punishment. This is about the death of Cherish Periwinkle. It's not about anything else, it's about the killing of Cherish Periwinkle, he said. Paul Hinson confirmed he remained confident in his decision to recommend the death penalty. If this crime didn't deserve the death penalty, then what does, he said. He also told the News 4 Jacks what he would say if he could say anything to Cherish. Quote, he li we listened to evidence that she left behind and we served justice for her, he said. We spoke for her during this trial, end of quote. Some of the jurors still meet up, sometimes to talk about the trial and sometimes to just talk about life. Donald, in the end, got what he wanted. He only took the jury 15 minutes to find him guilty. But in Florida, all cases involving first-degree murder are given an appeal. As such, Donald Smith reappeared in court in 2020, fully planning to fight his death sentence. Donald's attorney appealed his death sentence. On 22nd of April 2021, just last year, the Florida Supreme Court denied Donald Smith's appeal of his 2018 conviction for the crime. In its order, the court discounted five reasons raised in Donald Smith's appeal, including a failure to move the case to a different jurisdiction due to pre-trial publicity, the tearful testimony of the state medical examiner Valerie Rao, and the content of state attorney Melissa Nelson's opening argument, which Donald Smith's attorneys claimed were inappropriate. Donald Smith's appellate, appellate team will next file appeals with the first dis district court of appeals. Legal experts say the process of exhausting appeals can easily take a decade. As for Cherish's parents, her father, Billy Jarreau, wanted closure, while her mother, who has been struggling with her child's loss 
has been calling for Donald's execution. Rain also lost custody of her two younger daughters, Destiny and Nivea, and lost her home. Quote, more than anything else, I lost Cherish, she said, turning angrily toward Donald Smith in the most violent way possible. The mother of murder victim Cherish Periwinkle in court, fighting to get her two youngest children back tonight. For the first time since the state took custody of the girls, their father is speaking out. I'm the daddy. I'm going to take care of them. I'm going to do everything I can to, to take care of them and uh, be their daddy. Good evening. It's a custody battle that's in the public spotlight because the children involved are half sisters of eight year old Cherish Periwinkle, who was abducted and murdered back in June. Today, Judge David Gooding held a hearing to begin deciding the girls' future. They've been in state custody for the past month. At one point during the proceedings, attorneys for the state and attorneys for the children made a routine request to have the judge ask Rain Periwinkle to submit to a drug test. The judge agreed. After the hearing, she went to the drug testing room in the courthouse for the test. The results were not disclosed, but attorneys for the state say the last time she was tested, she passed. Tonight, only on four, the girl's father spoke with Haley Winslow and said how much he misses his daughters. Haley's joining us now with this interview. Haley. Tom, two nights ago, Rain Periwinkle told me she's ready to have her children back in her home. But tonight, the girl's father told me why he should have custody. Aaron Pearson says life without his little angels is painful. I've never been without them. I've never been in one day without them. It's, it's very, very hard. Very hard. Yeah, I think about them every day. Uh, you know, there are pictures on my phone. Um, it's very hard. But he understands why the state has stepped in. DCF and these agencies, they just want to make sure that we've gotten ourselves together and um, that we're on the right track to be able to take care of our children. And that's their job and uh, I'm going to cooperate with whatever they ask me to do. Pearson says the Department of Children and Families has asked him to get a two-bedroom apartment, and until he can, he'd like his five- and six-year-old girls to live with their grandfather. They've known my dad uh, all their life, and uh, they're comfortable with him. Um, and I would like them to be, you know, with him, obviously, until I do what I have to do to get them. And if he's allowed to bring Nevaeh and Destiny home, he promises to share them with Rain Periwinkle. If I were to get custody of the girls, I would definitely never, ever keep them from their mother. You know, they, girls have to have their mommy, and I would never keep them from her. He says especially after they lost Cherish, who they'll never be able to get back. I mean, I miss her every day. I think about her every day. Pearson says the tragedy of Cherish's death has split him and her mom apart, but even through the custody struggle, he says he still cares deeply for Periwinkle. He says he's just trying to do what's best for the other two girls. Lane Rain Periwinkle is becoming all too familiar with between custody battles for her other children and the pending murder trial for Donald Smith. I want to hold on to that little sliver of hope that I'm going to see them again, yes. I mean... I'm not going down without a fight. I know a lot of people say horrible things about me. They leave messages on my phone because they don't know. They don't know what really happened. They don't connect the dots. Perry Winkle tells me she's been fighting just to get by over the years since Cherish was abducted from this Northside Walmart and murdered. While dealing with the death of Cherish, she immediately had DCF talking to her about her other children, who she eventually lost custody of. They're now in foster care. In fact, one of the children had a hearing on the docket today. We were not allowed inside for that, and neither was Rain who says the court has not allowed her to have access to her children since March. I don't know where they live. I don't know where they go to school. We're not allowed to know anything about each other. It makes it so incredibly frustrating, so hard. Tomorrow, she says she's starting a new job, and that process has not been easy because she's publicly known right now, and she tells me that has hurt her chances at employment. Beyond that, there's Donald Smith. His trial keeps getting moved back, but Perry Winkle says she will be there when it finally happens. I have to do this for Cherish. It's not because I want to be there. I have to be there for Cherish. I just have doubts that this trial is going to come in January because they've already canceled it five times. I, I, I just don't see it. That's correct, Jeannie. Rain Periwinkle told me it was difficult watching Donald Smith during the trial. She says what happened five years ago is now her living nightmare. It is now your duty to make a decision as to the appropriate sentence.
that should be imposed upon the defendant. The guilty verdict was quick. The jury's recommendation of death for Donald Smith was clear. He never gave Cherish a chance. Justice for Cherish is over, but Rain Periwinkle told me her heart is still broken. She misses her daughter. I had a nightmare this morning. I mean, that, that's just usual. I wake up every morning feeling nauseous. It never goes away. Court testimony revealed in 2013, Smith targeted Perry Winkle and her three children. He would separate them at a Walmart and then kidnap or murder eight-year-old Cherish. The case attracted hateful comments on social media. Some blame Rain for what happened. Every time you read that, what do you think? It disgusts me how people, people are so quick to judge me. But she has also found support from other parents. What is it people misunderstand about you, Rain? What is it they miss? They misunderstand about me. They think that I gave my daughter Cherish away for a gift card and for drugs and for clothes and for food, and that wasn't true at all. That was absolutely false. I lost her. I lost everything. At one point during the trial, Smith wiped what appeared to be a tear from his eyes. Periwinkle was in the courtroom. I was infuriated. I, I, saw, the t I saw the tears. I was yelling, actually saying, yeah, shake those tears out. But he has no remorse, none. Fake tears. Yes, he was crying for himself. He wasn't crying for Cherish. He wasn't crying for any of the victims that he's had. He's crying for himself. She now works a part-time job to keep her mind occupied, but says her life will never be normal. I have triggers every day about this. I, I constantly think about it. It never leaves my mind. She says Smith on death row brings peace of mind. I will have some peace of mind, yes, knowing he will never hurt another child again. But she says there won't be any closure until the death sentence is carried out. But I do believe an eye for an eye. One day after new video was released of Donald Smith talking in jail about killing Cherish Periwinkle, the child's mother is speaking out. This is all about him. It's, they're making it about him. It's about Cherish. It's not about him. Rain Periwinkle now hopes that people will stop talking about Donald Smith because she believes he enjoys the attention. Before Cherish Periwinkle's murder, very few people knew who Donald Smith was. Now everyone knows he's a rape murderer. For the same reason, Cherish's mother, Rain Periwinkle, hopes that people will stop talking about her daughter's killer. Rain recalls the day she saw Smith smirking during the murder trial. I was trying to keep it together, and I had seen him so many times before that day. I saw his true character in the trial. He wouldn't stop smiling and smirking at people. He thought it was funny. Yeah, that's all about him. There were warning signs that Smith would hurt a child 10 years before he killed Cherish. I also talked with James Vallely, a licensed psychologist who evaluated Donald Smith. He wrote in this letter, I'm writing to express grave concerns about Mr. Donald Smith, who was attending my cycle treatment program. Smith also complained the program was too long and he wanted permission to see his children sooner. The letter was written May 23rd, 2002 and sent to Ernest Bell, an assistant state attorney. Smith's behavior was, quote, terribly troublesome and dangerous. Periwinkle believes Smith knew exactly what he was doing when he took her daughter. That's what he was hell bent on taking a child that night, but he had seen us, followed us to the store, waited for us. Rain is slowly healing since the murder trial ended last summer, but she misses Cherish and her two other daughters. She knows life will never be the same, but she says it's harder knowing Donald Smith is still alive. It's all about him. He wanted this about him. And if he didn't take my daughter away, he would have taken someone else. The younger sisters have been adopted by an aunt who lives in Australia. Ray said that the adoption by her sister was finalized in November 2016, but she didn't learn about it until another sister told her in February 2017. The custody proceeding for the girls was sealed by a judge. Destiny, 9 years old, and Nevea, 7 years old at that time, moved at the beginning of January 2017. The girl's former guardian, Patricia Parker, said that Rain had the chance to get her daughters back, but she didn't meet the criteria, which is why the state had no choice 
but to put them up for adoption. But Rain said after Cherry she was murdered, she was unable to keep a stable job and was often turned down because of who she was, because people blamed her for what happened to Cherish. On top of that, she was grieving the loss of her child and she was in a dark place. Rain is furious and hurt that her other girls were sent to live in Australia. I am their mother. I would die for them. I don't care what anyone else says, Rain said. I would go without my children and there is so much not being said right now. The former guardian said that once a birth parent's rights are terminated, the system typically seeks family members to adopt children, which worked out in this case. She said that going to Australia and starting a new life with family is the best thing for them. Their mother, Rain, said she hasn't spoken to her sister in years and believes the only reason her sister and her brother-in-law got married was to take the children away from her. The former guardian said that the couple had been together for years and got married to make sure everyone knew they were serious about providing a stable situation for the girls, even though Florida statute doesn't require couples to be married to adopt. Ray said that she wasn't given a fair opportunity to prove her ability to take care of the girls. The last time she saw them was during visitation in March 2016. She told them she would continue fighting to get them back and feels she was shut out of the process when she lost her parental rights. I wish they would just feel for one day what they've done to me, she said. It's not all about myself. Cherish is the biggest victim in this. She is the biggest victim. But because I'm her mother, I'm the adult, I do the interviews and go to court hearings. But Destiny and Nivea Periwinkle are victims in this too. She said she misses simple things like watching Cherish play with her sisters, brushing her hair and waiting for her to get home from school. Because Cherish was born on Christmas Eve, the holiday season, no longer holds any joy for her. When other people are celebrating Christmas Eve, to them it is Christmas Eve, but in my mind it will always be Cherish's birthday, she said. Since she was taken from me, we have never been able to spend the holidays together as a family and I never will again. Rain sees reminders of Cherish every day and there is no cure for her emotional pain. It has been four years and nine months, she said, but for me, it will always feel like yesterday. The mother of murdered eight-year-old Cherish Periwinkle says she went on national TV today to try to clear her name. Rain Periwinkle volunteered for a drug test and a polygraph test on the Dr. Oz show, hoping for vindication in the court of public opinion. You can't stop all the hate. You, you, can, you can never stop all the hate. People are going to hate you regardless. But I want to at least clear the air. I did not know him beforehand. Cherish Periwinkle's mother, Rain, pushes back against years old accusations that she knowingly put her eight year old daughter in danger with convicted murderer Donald Smith. Some people say I was into human trafficking. I sold her for a gift card, I sold my daughter to him for uh, crack. I knew him, I had a relationship with him. All these crazy stories, that's not true. She volunteered to take a lie detector test to prove she had nothing to do with her daughter's murder and she wanted to be tested for drugs. Polygraph tests tell you that you were telling, say tell us that you were telling the truth. Rain, alongside Dr. Oz and talk show host Nancy Grace says she felt she was stalked by Donald Smith even days before the kidnapping. She said her daughter Cherish trusted Donald because she did. Rain also blames the Jacksonville Sheriff's Office for not taking her seriously when she first reported her daughter missing. There was time, Dr. Oz, there was time to find her. She endured for hours and hours before she was killed and five hours passed before they issued an amber alert they didn't look for her for more than five hours and i knew she was gone i felt it in my spirit i can't feel her anymore rain periwinkle also said the officer with jso who responded the night of her daughter's disappearance blamed her and said to her you did this claiming she was hiding her own daughter while in a custody battle the Jacksonville Sheriff's Office conducted an internal investigation into the initial response of the kidnapping of Cherish. Several officers were cited for failure to conform to work standards, including the lieutenant in charge of the homicide division. He was removed from that position. Now, I'm going to say that the press completely vilified Rain from the beginning. And when I started my research 
on this case and I read press articles about the case, I blamed Rain for her daughter's disappearance and I saw her as someone who keeps trying to kind of justify herself and point out it wasn't her fault, finding excuses after excuses and I'm sure that a lot of you who are familiar with this case might have had the same view as I did. The thing is though, news articles will only write what sells and what sells best? Drama. Yes, in various articles I found quotes from Rain's 911 call making her look like she's been trying to shift the blame away from her and these people in the media, whoever is writing these articles, they took all these quotes from the 911 call out of context other articles even said that Rain only called 911 two hours after Cherish went missing. But that's not the case. I listened to her 911 call. I watched the trial, her testimony on the stand, other witnesses' testimonies. I watched her in various interviews and she seems nothing like what the media makes her seem like. This is the reason why I even decided to cover this case in two parts because I wanted to give you clear information including court footage, 911 calls, recordings and as many details as I could. Rain is a completely broken woman and she still blames herself for allowing Cherish to go to McDonald's with Donald. Yes, I do think that she shouldn't have done it, this certainly set the things into motion for Cherish and her death and if she wouldn't have allowed Cherish to leave, maybe Cherish would still be alive today. However, we also need to remember that Donald planned this, he planned to do something that night and if he wouldn't be Cherish, he would have been someone else. Also, the most important thing is Cherish's death could have been prevented if Donald wouldn't be released. He got off lightly on all those sentences and that's on the courts and that's on the justice system. Donald Smith's trial has been repeatedly delayed over issues with Florida's death penalty law. His trial began in February 2018 he was sentenced to death in May 2018. In April 2021, he unsuccessfully attempted to appeal his sentence. He is currently, as of right now, on death row. Cherish's father, Billy Jarro, prepared a statement for the court and it reads, quote, First of all, I would like to thank Melissa Nelson, Mark Lyle, Vanessa Wheeler and all of the fine people at the state's attorney's office for their amazing dedication to finding justice for my daughter Cherish. I would like to thank the court and the staff and finally, I would like to thank GSO for their incredible work on this case. Also, I would like to commend the defense attorneys Julie Schlecks and Charles Fletcher for their professionalism and acknowledge the difficulty of their job and their commitment to a noble profession. Unfortunately, I cannot be present and I have asked my attorney and friend Gerald Wilkerson to read my, my victim impact statement. I was asked to write a victim impact statement about how losing my daughter so tragically has impacted my life. As I sit here thinking of the impact this senseless murder has had on me and my family, I realize that there is no way that words can describe the impact of losing one's child. I am fighting back tears as I write this, but I push through because this is the last thing I can do for my child. I never really believed in angels until Cherish came into my life. She was sweet, kind, funny and pure love. She had so much potential and the little time that I had with her on this earth was precious to me. Cherish was a light in my life and in the lives of many people. Donald Smith took that light out of the world. I used to wake up and think about our time together, the good times, when she would laugh, when she would throw her arms around me and tell me she loved me, when she would play with my son, her younger brother. I used to dream big dreams of a wonderful future. I would wonder, will she get married? What college will she go to? Will she have children? Now my life is filled with sorrow, dread and nightmares of knowing she is gone and especially how she died. How horrible those last minutes must have been for her. How she must have called out for help and this feeling that I wasn't able to help her. 
I had so many regrets that I didn't have more time with Cherish and I was looking forward to spending the summer together. It all ended far too soon and my hopes and dreams for Cherish and our special relationship was smashed on June 22nd, 2013. I remember getting up that morning and being so excited that I was going to pick up my daughter from airport. I couldn't wait to give my little girl a big hug. Instead of a hug, I received the most devastating news that any parent can receive, that my child had been murdered. In that moment, all the dreams of our planned summer and every summer to come, every day, every moment were destroyed, taken from me by the actions of Donald Smith. Cherish isn't here to speak for herself. She will never again be able to speak or laugh or dream. And as her parent, I will never hear her voice or know her thoughts or see her grow into the incredible person I know she could have become. Her brother, grandparents, cousins, all of us will forever suffer from the void in our lives with her gone. Donald Smith took, took that from her and he took that from me and all of us. And I never really believed in monsters. I do now. And forever, the images of my child's last minutes on this earth will play out in my mind like a private internal hell that never ends. End of quote. And this is the truly tragic story of Cherish Periwinkle. And uh, again, this uh, case is covered in two parts. So, both of, so the links will be in the description down below and as well somewhere here on the screen. And uh, like I said at the beginning of this video, please make sure that you do watch part one before you watch part two, this part. Otherwise, the whole thing is not going to make much sense because like I said, I, I went very deep into all of the details because I wanted to give you all of the information and uh, as accurate as I possibly could rather than just focusing my research on media articles. So uh, I really did uh, watch trial footage and all these kind of things and uh, read a lot and researched a lot just to make sure that I give you the most accurate information that I can. So again, I'm going to say, please make sure you do watch both of the parts as there will be a court footage in them, 911 calls and uh, also interrogation tapes and more more things. So yeah, and before you form your final uh, opinion on Rain Periwinkle, Please just take into account all of the things that I told you and I showed you in uh, the two parts of this series. And uh, let me know of your thoughts and opinions in the comment section down below. For now, thank you so much for watching. Take care, stay safe and I'll see you in the next one. Bye!